Oh wait, I just did start the thing. Um, we didn't want to do that. Um, about that, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Drew, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm Betsy Parrish from Hamlin University, and I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota, where um, we're the home of more refugees per capita in the United States. And also, we um, have over 100 languages spoken in the homes of families that are um, in our public school system. So. As you can imagine, we are um, in an area with very diverse needs with regard to differentiation. So my work here at Hamlin is to provide support to teachers, both pre-service and in-service. So I'm a professor in language teacher education here. I'd love to know who's here in the audience though. If we could just take a quick poll to find out who's, who's here. And before that, though, let's just take a look quickly at our objectives. So we're going to articulate the dimensions of multi-level classes. So what does that actually mean? Articulate how to respond to the needs of learners in these diverse settings through three dimensions of differentiation. And then finally, we're going to identify and develop differentiated examples to optimize learning for multi-level groups of learners. So I think no matter what your setting and what your needs are, or who your learners are, I hope that you'll have some um, takeaways today that would help you respond more um, effectively and efficiently to students in your classes. So here's our poll. I spoke too soon a moment ago. Who's here today? So we're gonna see who works with primary age, younger learners, who's in a secondary or high school setting, who works with adults in a community or adult education setting, and who works in college, university, and this could be um, in an English dominant country, in a country where English is taught as a subject area, English as a second language, additional language. We'll take another about uh, 30 seconds here. Okay, I think, it's, I think it's slowed down. So Drew, you can go ahead and close the poll and let's see who's here today. All right, so it looks like the majority of the folks here today work in a community college or adult education setting. We've got another large group of you working in college or universities. Um, so it looks like only about a quarter of us are in an English dominant country. So welcome to all of those who are coming from all over the world to join us today. And then a smaller number of you who are teaching in secondary or primary. But what this says to me is that the topic of differentiation and the need to differentiate and serve multi-level classes is really a universal question or topic, isn't it? So thank you. Okay, just a second. Sorry about that. So I have another poll for you already. Sometimes when people think about multi-level classes, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, oh, I'm sorry, there we are. The first thing that comes to mind is issues of language proficiency, but we're gonna ask you to think more broadly about the multi-level classroom if we could. So once more, let's poll, let's take a short poll here. When you think of multi-level, which of these factors come to mind? Select one or more of the following issues that you encounter or differences, not issues, but differences among learners in your setting. Different educational backgrounds, different proficiencies across skill areas, different expectations, different personalities or ways of being in the world, maybe different motivations for learning English. Okay. All right, go ahead and close the poll, Drew. Thank you. All right, so it looks like, here we go, I can put it, um, learners have, you're encountering all of these issues. It seems like um, 
educational backgrounds, proficiencies, all of these are critical issues for you. Maybe the one that doesn't rate quite so highly as the expectations and preferences for teaching and learning. But all of these seem to be critical issues in your settings, don't they? So that's what we're going to be thinking about today. How do we take a broader look at multi-level instruction and look beyond language proficiency level? And how can we make sure that our tasks, our content, and our materials are addressing the needs of a very broad range of students? If you, if you downloaded the handout, you'll see on page one, I have a complete list that organizes it according to these different types of factors, including proficiency, experience with education, cultural background, individual and situational factors. So I invite you to take a look at that handout when you have some time, just to really appreciate the complexity of multi-level instruction in our settings across the world. Now, what we're going to think about today is this idea of differentiating by design to address the needs in a multi-level classroom. And I'm sure that many of you have been to workshops or done reading or thought a lot about this talk of, topic of multi-level classes. I was really inspired by the work of Tomlins, Tomlinson and Imbo, and they think about differentiation through a lens of content, process, and product. So really looking closely at the what we teach, the how we teach, and by product, you're gonna see that we mean what are our final um, takeaways or pro final products or assessments that show us that learners are meeting our objectives. So by content, we mean what do learners need to know and understand, and this could be content knowledge such as economics or numeracy, or it could be the language we need to be successful in completing the task, as in like the language functions and forms or new vocabulary, okay? So how can we differentiate content? Well, we can vary the level and the complexity of the content itself. In other words, we can have sort of novice and expert content provided to students. We can also vary the complexity of the texts that we provide in terms of the lexile, the reading level, um, the load, the length. We can vary the modalities of content that we present to students in the same class. So we might have some students doing readings, listening, speaking. Some might be accessing things in print. Some might be accessing information digitally. And then finally, regardless of what we're teaching, we can really provide a lot of choice of topics within a larger theme, as we'll see in an example here momentarily. We can also think about the process or how do we implement our curriculum. So think of this as what are, the, um, what are our instructional decisions that we make in order, to, um, in order to support the widest range of learners possible. So this can happen by varying the complexity of the task itself. So not just the material, but the task itself. So some students might be provided with a word bank or they might be provided with lang more language frames to support the task. They might need more scaffolds. So some students might be asked to answer some questions from a reading while another student or some other students might be asked to read and fill in a graphic organizer like this one. We can vary the learner roles and responsibilities in our lessons. So learners, sorry, learners might take on the role of teacher, facilitator, coach. Maybe some students have stronger uh, digital literacy skills than others so they can help others along the way. And then finally, we wanna think about um, our products. So how do learners demonstrate that they've been learning the targets for our lesson? How are they meeting our objectives? And to do that, we could vary the complexity of the final product itself. We could vary the quantity or depth of responses in a final product. And by final product, this could be an essay, this could be a quiz, this could be um, a PowerPoint, this could be any kind of um, final outcome, what the students do to demonstrate learning. We could vary the modalities, whether it's oral or written, and then we can vary the type of final product. For example, some students might write a report, some students might create a, a graph or a visual representation and a poster, some students might make a podcast and some students might record a video. Now, right about now, sorry. Um, you're thinking, well, what about the learners? This is all based on what the learners needs are, right? So what's the learner's readiness? Think about that. How ready are they to 
how prepared are they and how ready are they for the content skills and language demands of a particular classroom task, topic, or unit? This will vary, right? How about their interest? What content and knowledge and skills will be of most interest to learners and by extension motivate them the most? How about their affect? How might the learners' attitudes, emotions, or feelings affect learning? And then how do learners approach learning? This is their learning profile. Um, what are their preferences? What are some of their cultural expectations about teaching and learning and the roles that teachers take on or varying expectations about roles that learners take on in the classroom? Now, right about now, I bet you're thinking, how can I do all of this, right? That's a question that many people ask when we think about multi-level classes. How can I possibly address all of these different dimensions and all of these varying needs in the classroom? Well, rest assured that you don't need to def differentiate all of these elements, the process, the product, and the products all of the time. What I'm hoping is that you'll get some inspiration today about things that you could adjust in your teaching that are gonna give more students a better shot at success. So as you get to know your learners more and more, and you think about it through this lens of content, process, and product, I'm really hoping that differentiating by design will become more of a habit for you instead of having to respond as issues come up in the classroom. So now, let's see what this looks like in very practical terms. We're gonna go through two different samples this afternoon where we look at it through this lens of content, process and product and see the different ways that we can respond to a multi-level classroom. Take a look at this activity for a moment and it's an activity on work, for working and career explorations in an adult ESL program here in the United States. So it's a problem solving activity, it's a decision making activity, it's very collaborative. Um, the students are going to think about what if they were to start a small business? What would that entail? What kind of expertise do they need? And they're going to be asked to do some online research in teams and choose a targeted neighborhood for starting a small business, research businesses in that area, and really do a deep dive into um, information in their community to decide um, which, if any of these, would be a suitable small business for them to pursue. Now, I know that many of you are not in a context where this particular task would be relevant for your learners. All of us do problem solving activities, right? It's very, this type of task is actually quite common. So as I'm working through the steps for differentiation, if you could just please be thinking of, okay, that would work for my setting where choose, students are choosing a major, they're, they're exploring a major for university, or maybe they're choosing a career path or maybe they're choosing places where they'd like to travel. Or maybe they're thinking about if they were hosting people coming to their country, if they had to choose and prioritize um, a, an itinerary for people. So while this particular topic is really, uh, could be really relevant for students in my setting, adult learners who maybe come with prior business experiences who wanna start a small business, this may not, the topic may not be relevant. And that's the whole point. We wanna make sure our tasks become relevant for our learners. So for this particular example, we're gonna take a look at the content demands and then the process and the products needed to be successful, okay? So first of all, for students to be successful with this class activity, they have to understand um, topics like entrepreneurship, working with small businesses, they need language functions like asking for and giving opinions. They need the language for making suggestions, describing options, stating preferences. They're also gonna need a lot of language forms like the modal verbs of possibility. Um, maybe we could start a food truck in this neighborhood because, um, so there's a lot of language there. And then a lot of vocabulary like renting versus leasing, competition, availability, benefits, drawbacks, and then finally, a lot of critical thinking as they have to evaluate the, re real, I'm sorry, the re reliability of information that they gather online and as they analyze options. So again, if you could just be thinking about a similar type of activity with your students where they're gonna do decision-making, problem-solving, that's the sort of language, the functions and the forms they may need and the critical thinking skills they're going to need to, um, they're gonna need to employ to be successful with an activity like this. 
process. What about the process? They have to be able to work online, find information online, collaborate with others, present findings to others, and then listen to presentations from others. And the product, the final product suggested here is that they'll create uh, a, post, a PowerPoint or some form to either a, a PowerPoint or a poster that they will share with others. And in my classes, what I would do is have a gallery walk where each team presents their presentation and others walk around and uh, learn from one another. So that's the current task as it stands. Now let's see what we could do to differentiate this task so that we can meet more learners' needs. We're going to use this framework. So we're gonna look at the content process and products for doing that task successfully, and then see what kind of adjustments we need to make based on the learner readiness, learner interest, and the learner profile. Okay, so, so their content is small business entrepreneurship. How ready are learners for that topic? Well, we could vary, um, and you know, they're going to do some research. So we could vary the sources that they're going to look at to learn about this content with level appropriate language. So that will be, you know, we'll have to find websites that might have lots of visual supports. Um, we also want to make sure we direct them to information that's um, that represents their own levels of expertise. Um, we might have to do some vocabulary development work to help them beforehand, like we would do in any language classroom as a support. What about interest? Well, this activity is about starting a small business. Now, are those the small businesses that these learners are interested in? Let's find out. So don't feel tied to what the topics are. This is where I'm talking about choice of topic. Don't be tied to using food trucks and, um, you know, a restaurant and starting a small market, maybe they have other ideas that they could use to replace what's in the existing material. So feel free to do that with your students. And then also let the students generate a list of options. Also think about any prior experiences learners have had with whatever it is you're teaching. So in this case, when we're working with adult immigrant and refugee students, many of them may have had prior experiences with small businesses or maybe in farming, selling things at market. So make sure we leverage that. And then maybe share some success stories of immigrants who've started small businesses. In the case my earlier, I said to think of other applications of these steps. If you were doing something on, on exploring different career paths or different majors, this is where you might share stories of other students who've made certain decisions in their lives and the successes that they've had. And then let's think about learner profile. So let's make sure that we provide multiple means of accessing information based on learners' preferences, strengths, you know, use video, websites, readings as sources, not just one mode. Also make sure that make sure that the material is culturally relevant and then also accessible in terms of level of expertise, whatever our content is. Okay, let's think about process now. So we might have to give students some language frames in order to engage with the activities we're doing. So could remember that process is the ways that we teach. So we have our tasks in our books, but sometimes we need to think of ways that we're going to implement them to give students more success. Maybe model you doing a web search for this activity. Also, I think this is a great chance to, you, to really use translanguaging or really leveraging the first language as a resource. So students could explore the content that they're learning about in their own language, do note taking in their first language, and then create their, artifact, their, their poster or their PowerPoint in English. What about interest? Well, sometimes we want, you know, students may not be interested in a topic. We can look at the pros and cons of starting a small business or pros and cons of a particular major in school or whatever your topic happens to be. And then learners can create groups for projects like this one based on their common interests, right? Finally, let's make sure that we vary our instruction to respond to different ways of learning or ways of being. So students sometimes want some quiet time. They need to some independent time to think. And then they might want options for developing. They want, you could give them different options for developing the product, whether it's shared electronically. Some people want to work with pen and paper. Maybe some want to take photos on their phone. And then also make sure that you give them supports that kind of 
um, highlight or let's say speak to their strengths. So if they're very visual, maybe they could use some graphic organizers to organize information as they plan their, their final pr um, project. And then finally, the product. So if you remember, for the activity, students were asked to make a PowerPoint or a poster as a final product, but I think we could be really creative and think of other ways. Maybe they do a PowerPoint, but maybe they make a video or a podcast for those with stronger oral skills. Um, make sure that as they're making their final product, they're encouraged to make contribution, contributions based on their interests. So somebody who's more interested in numbers and data could work on some, some numerical displays on a project like this. Also, I suggested that for your final activities, you might have students present a poster or an, a final project or product to others, have the students themselves generate the questions that they would ask each other during presentations or during a gallery walk. And then finally, it's not just varying the products, but also allow for a variety of formats. So for example, some students might wanna do a skit, a podcast, a short manual, uh, maybe frequently asked questions or a tip sheet. So if you take a look, if you'd like, um, after the webinar on page, uh, uh, you'll see a completed chart on your handout as well. So I've taken a look at that task about a business. I've considered content process and product, learner readiness, interest and profile. And I really thought deeply about the different ways that I might have to modify that task based on a variety of learners in the classroom. So this is just one example, and again, it may, not, um, it may not represent the topics that you would choose, but I hope that it gives you some ideas of the sorts of, um, sorts of strategies you could use to differentiate. We're gonna look at another sample. Um, this one is about online versus in-store shopping. Uh, last fall, in our certificate program, one of my student teachers, Bethany Helen, um, was doing a lesson in the theme, it was a unit on consumerism and shopping. That was the theme at our practicum site. So when we go to our practicum, the, the teachers will ask us to develop lessons that correspond to what they've been working on in the classroom. So Helen, so Bethany found this freely accessible infographic that I thought and she thought was really, really compelling. However, when you think about it, it's pretty demanding as an activity, isn't it? So that students would have to interpret the infographic, they have to understand percentages and bar graphing, they have to use quantifying words and phrases, and then they also have to know a lot of different, more specialized vocabulary, like um, beauty products, cleaning supplies, these different categories, perishable versus non-perishable. So there is quite a bit of, um, there's quite a lot in there for students to unpack to really understand this graphic. So the learning objectives for her lesson were to interpret an infographic about online versus in-store shopping. We also noted she, the students really need to use a lot of quantifiers to talk about the categories and the data that's presented in that great visual. We need to talk about why certain items are bought in certain places. Clearly something like perishable goods are probably bought more in-store than online. And then also she wanted students to do some descriptive reasoning with words like because, so I can, or so they can. So having students talk about why people would buy online versus in stores. Okay, now here was the learner profile for this class. We had a very large class for th of 35 or more students each night, sometimes up to 40. Some had interrupted or limited prior formal schooling. There were varying literacy and oral proficiency levels in the class. So some students were really very literate, but really had you know, minimal oral skills. And then we had many students who were very proficient with their oral language and were working on basic literacy because of interrupted prior formal schooling. Some uh, had very limited digital literacy skills. Some don't shop online. And some had very little experience working with infographics. So let's see how we can differentiate this particular lesson by design. So first of all, let's see if we can break our tasks down. Sometimes we present too much information to students at one time. So a great way to start differentiation is just to break it down. So taking one line at a time with the graphic, how many people buy perishable groceries in stores? Almost everyone buys perishable groceries in store. How many people buy cleaning supplies in store? More than half the class, half the people buy cleaning supplies in store. 
So just a way to break it down, really model, modeling here as well, projecting this for the class and working through each item line by line. Now, some students, she found, really needed a lot of support. So we provided language frames, almost everyone, more than half, less than half, very few, as well as some really targeted guided practice to work on this reading text, okay? So both guided practice with some questions and answers to fill in, language frames, and then some partner work in order to work with this infographic. Language frames are a great support for all learners, but let's not forget that we can vary the level of the frames themselves. So yes, we could give almost everyone, less than half, more than half, very few. However, there might be students who are ready for more complex phrases. More than two thirds of the class, considerably more people, just over half, okay? Now, while some students in the group were doing the guided practice, filling in, um, using the language frames to access the text. Some of the students with a higher proficiency level could be working on this small group discussion at the same time. So that's the idea of differentiating the complexity of our tasks in our classes and being comfortable doing so. Another thing that we need to remember that corresponds to differentiation in the multi-level class is that we want to make sure that even our reading lessons are very multimodal. So in this particular class, the students used the information that they learned about and they conducted a one question survey. So they collected data about their classmates. Where do you buy perishable groceries? Where do you buy clothing? Where do you buy cleaning supplies? Mingling with just one question in hand and collecting data. Now everybody in the class took part in this in her lesson and everybody could take part in this. And the reason this is a highly differentiated task potentially is that students can answer based on their proficiency level with as little as yes, no, or in-store, online, and tally each other's answers. Or while doing this task, they might be able to expand and practice some of that reasoning. Okay, so respond, or um, Adding a layer of speaking, listening, interaction to any lesson is a great way to make sure that we're meeting the needs of a wider array, array of learners. Now, we could also extend this for students who have the means and think about differentiation as, well, those students who have access to technology, who want practice with digital literacy, perhaps they could do that same activity, the one question survey, but they could create an online poll using Poll Everywhere or using Kahoot. They could send that to their classmates. They could project it as a group. They could. There are many, many different ways that they could do that. You could also ask them to interview families, friends, and coworkers for more challenge as part of our process. So as you saw for this example, I really focused a lot on the processes that were used in that lesson in order to differentiate instruction because of this wide range of learners in the classroom. We can also differentiate the products. So students could do graphs about the shopping habits of their classmates, which is what they did. And then they can do short presentations to class colleagues about their findings. So here are the results from the question, do you buy clothes online, in store, or both? So each um, small group of students could work on one topic, one question, and become experts on that, and then get practice in presenting that to others. So other students maybe want to practice more writing. So, and depending on their literacy level, perhaps they would just write one or two sentences that summarize some findings. Or you could do a short report about the group using a paragraph frame like this one. So reporting on class preferences after the one question survey, maybe um, a large uh, percentage of the group or most of the people in our class shop for hmm, online. So whatever. What I love here is that the outcome of this uh, task is totally um, situated in or or participant centered for that particular group of students um, in your class that day or that week. So there's no one right answer to this, but it gives the students an opportunity to apply their learning using this frame. Language and, language and paragraph frames are just a wonderful support or scaffold for the multi-level classroom. 
Some students might want to do an oral report. Maybe they could report, record a summary of their findings from the one question survey and share it with others for and for teacher feedback. Or they could do short video recorded summaries. I make a lot of one minute to two minute video clips on a variety of topics, both of other people that I bring into my classroom or that students record in the class in real time and then share that information with one another. Okay, so now, based on what you've heard, I want you to think for a minute, which are you most likely to differentiate in your setting? Okay, so which of these, and you can, um, you can choose, you know, maybe it's all three, maybe it's one over the other. Which are you most likely to differentiate? The content, as in, you know, the topics, um, the themes that you're covering, the process, or in other words, the ways that you implement your curriculum, the ways that you conduct instruction, um, the tasks that you have students take part in, or the products, the final outcomes. So take a minute and Drew will share a poll with us. We're gonna see which of these three seem most feasible in your settings. So Drew, you're gonna launch the poll. Oh, actually, you know what? That's okay. We will we will do okay. This is a slightly different poll. Um, I think we we that's just fine. Think about the actual topics we talked about today. So, um, are you most likely to are you likely to provide learners choice? Vary the complexity of language and tasks. Vary the supports needed for different learners. Um, promote the use of varied modalities for different learners, or encourage a range of final products. So, go ahead. Which of these are you? most likely to try in your setting. Take about another 10 seconds. Or 15. Okay, thank you. Let's see, so we'll see the results here in a second. Whoops. So Drew, I'm not, I'm not seeing the results of the poll quite yet. I can see the answers though in my notes here. And it seems like um, providing supports and scaffolds and varying the complexity of the tasks are the two that seem to be the most feasible or the most popular for people. I think maybe providing learners with choice of topics and content, that one is a little less popular. About 16% of you are suggesting that that would be um, feasible. And then 19, 20, about 20% 20 would give a range of final products. So again, it looks like varying complexity and varying the supports or scaffolds needed. Um, so let's just do a little bit of review. So we've thought about content. So learners can have choice of topics and content, and that could be the choice within a broader theme. So making, um, it's not that they're gonna completely shape the curriculum, but if you are learning about a particular topic, let the learners have some choice in the sub-themes or subtopics that they wanna explore. Complexity of language and task type. Um, we talked about different processes, language frames at varying levels using graphic organizers, varying roles and responsibilities, outside of class tasks, digital tasks, okay? And then final, finally, products that we might use, different types of final products, different formats, different modalities, okay? So, so for more ideas on differentiation, I'm in my late book, my, the new edition of my book, on teaching adult learners, English language learners. There's a whole chapter focused on optimizing learning and a big section on uh, working with multi-level classes. And then the Tomlinson book is sort of the inspiration for the product process and product, um, pro I'm sorry, content for, uh, process and product framework. And her work is in the K-12 world 
a public school, you know, elementary, secondary education here in the states. But it's uh, I hope that it, I've shown you that this pro, um, this framework can work really well for the language classroom as well. And then finally, a, really a must-have if you work with adult learners um, is teaching multi-level classes in ESL. That's the focus is adult ESL, but it certainly could be used for other settings as well. So let's open it up to questions. Thanks so much, Betsy. Uh, really quick, but before we go to questions, I just wanted to remind everybody that again, this webinar um, is being recorded. So we're gonna share that recording via email along with your certificate of participation in one to two weeks. And uh, so go ahead and look out for that. And now I'm gonna hand the questions over to Kyoko that she's been collecting throughout the webinar to share with Betsy. Thank you. Thank you, Drew, and thank you, Betsy, for the great information during the webinar. Um, if you have any questions to all the participants, if you could just type them in the questions box, um, we can answer them as, um, as many as we have time for. So first question, Betsy, that I have here is, um, when students go outside the classroom and perform in the real world, there's a big chance they will communicate in their first language with friends and family. Do you mm -hmm. see this to be an issue, or is it okay as long as they find they present their findings um, in their in English when they come back to class? Right, I, that's a great question. Um, I think it's totally appropriate if that's the way that they can um, dig into the content more profoundly. Think about it. If you were um, doing a task like a research project in a in a second language, you would be able to process that information more deeply, access information that's maybe more cognitively, um, like developmentally appropriate and interesting for you. Of course, if they're able to do it in English with other English speakers, I think that would be great. If they have uh, friends and family who do speak English so that they can continue to practice their skills outside of class. But the idea of translanguaging that I mentioned is really um, not limiting the um, learner's cognitive abilities just because they happen to be a beginner. So that's that's kind of my thinking there, or intermediate for that matter. So by, by leveraging the first language resources, um, strategies, skills, note taking, that's a great way for them to get more content expertise, but then you know, work with them to develop the product, the final product in English, along with all that language development that I mentioned. So I'm not saying to, you know, we're, we're certainly going to be um, working to develop the skills and strategies and the language they need. I hope that answers your question. I think we're kind of moving away from this idea that somehow, um, you know, the first language is a deficit. It's not. You know, let's leverage what we know in our first language and use that as a starting point. So it's judicious use and, and um, you know, using it as a, a, a springboard then for further practice in English. Kyoka, do you have any, any other questions? Um, yeah, hold on. We have some coming in. Um, regarding different modalities, have mm -hmm. you considered offering these webinars with live captioning? <laughs> I work at a school for the deaf and these oh my goodness. webinars are not accessible for many of my colleagues. Thank you so much for that, that suggestion and comment. Um, I think I'll make sure that Kyoko Drew and I talk about making sure that if there if there is an option, I'm not sure for um, having a version where closed captioning can be added. Um, but thank you, no, I, I really take that, that comment and that suggestion, that question to heart. So I think with all materials, for example, in my online courses that I teach or in the videos that we embed in the classes, we always make sure indeed that we have closed captioning as an option. So um, thank you for that, that suggestion. Um, another question, how would you apply your methods to a smaller group of five to eight students instead of an mm -hmm. entire classroom? What a great question, yeah. Um, well, as, as with any group, I think each group of learners will have strengths they'll have different interests, they'll have different um, learning profiles. And in some ways that smaller class makes some of this a little bit easier because they can really work together to negotiate and maybe prioritize different topics of interest to them. Imagine if you were using project-based learning, and I know some of you maybe attended Patsy's great webinar last week. If you're doing project-based learning with a smaller team, you could certainly have them negotiate who's going to take on which responsibilities depending on their strengths. So who's the one who really likes to go 
get, go online and collect information, um, who wants to interview others, who wants to create uh, maybe a video. So I, to be honest with you, I think that you know you you could really apply the steps, um, and in some ways it might be easier <laughs> than with a large group. But and I guess my point too, and I think this is what you're raising, is that just because there are only five students doesn't mean there's not great variety within that that small smaller group of students. So um, I hope that gives you some ideas or responds a bit to what you asked. Thank you for that great question. Kind of similar or going off on that point, do, do you recommend separating groups by language levels or mix them up? And if you do mix them up, how do you ensure students with less language skills participate in the group activities? Great question there too. Well, in that, when I do mixed ability groups, a, a strategy that I think is really critical in the multi-level classroom is role assignment. So for example, um, the student that tends to monopolize all the time, I might have them be the recorder. Um, not every time, you don't wanna to be too obvious, right? But I might have them be the recorder in a group activity. Um, in other words, they're gonna keep track of what they're gonna to report to the whole group. And then ask the students who maybe get, um, who aren't maybe as, who don't participate as much, ask them if they could be the facilitator. Their role is to make sure that everybody in the group has made a contribution. Um, so I think role assignment is a really great way to um, even out participation. The other one, I want to go back to my um, language frames. Jeff Zwiers um, is an expert in serving English learners in our mainstream classes here in the United States, as in English learners who are in the math classes and social studies, the regular content courses. Um, and he has wonderful supports at his website, and we can add that um, to the resource. Um, he has great, great uh, language frames, supports, um, tools that you can share with students. So remember I shared the language frames earlier for talking about quantity. Well, maybe you share the language frames to sustain a conversation. Like, what do you think? We haven't heard from um, Bang. Um, if you ask me, you know, the different phrases that we need, whether it's asking for and giving opinion, agreeing and disagreeing, also elaborating on others' ideas, and also bringing others into the conversation, those are all essential language functions to maintain a good, robust discussion. So we can give those phrases to the students while they're engaging in those tasks. And I think that's a great way to prompt and promote um, greater success and more likelihood that students will participate evenly. Because sometimes I think the reason they don't is they just don't have the language. Yeah. Right, thank you, Betsy. I think that's all the time we have. I know we have some great questions that are still on deck. And we'll note all of these and um, we'll see if we can answer them in another form, like a blog or um, in the future. So thank you, Betsy, again. And thank you to everyone who attended. I know I see people from all around the world. I know it's late for some of you. And so we really appreciate that you came to listen to us. Um, so I hope everyone has a good day ahead or a good evening, wherever, depending where you are. Thank you. And if I could, yes, thank you all so much for attending and for participating. And I hope that you leave with some takeaways that are suitable for your setting that you can apply with the content and the learners that you're serving. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Kyoko and Drew, so much for your invitation and support and to Cambridge as well.